Chapter Nineteen of Anna Karenina, Book Eight by Leo Tolstoy, translated by Constance Garnett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Going out of the nursery and being again alone, Levin went back at once to the thought in which there was something not clear. Instead of going into the drawing room where he heard voices, he stopped on the terrace and, leaning his elbows on the parapet, he gazed up at the sky. It was quite dark now, and in the south, where he was looking, there were no clouds. The storm had drifted on to the opposite side of the sky, and there were flashes of lightning and distant thunder from that quarter. Levin listened to the monotonous drip from the lime trees in the garden, and looked at the triangle of stars he knew so well, and the Milky Way, with its branches that ran through its midst. At each flash of lightning the Milky Way, and even the bright stars, vanished but as soon as the lightning died away they reappeared in their places as though some hand had flung them back with careful aim well what is it perplexes me levin said to himself feeling beforehand that the solution of his difficulties was already in his soul though he did not know it yet yes the one unmistakable incontestable manifestation of the divinity is the law of right and wrong which has come into the world by revelation, and which I feel in myself, and in the recognition of which, I don't make myself, but whether I will or not, I am made one with other men, in one body of believers, which is called the church. Well, but the Jews, the Mohammedans, the Confucians, the Buddhists, what of them? He put to himself the question he had feared to face, can these hundreds of millions of men be deprived of that highest blessing without which life has no meaning? He pondered a moment, but immediately corrected himself. But what am I questioning? he said to himself. I am questioning the revelation to divinity of all the different religions of mankind. I am questioning the universal manifestation of God to all the world with all those misty blurs. What am I about? To me individually— to my heart has been revealed a knowledge beyond all doubt, and unattainable by reason. And here I am, obstinately trying to express that knowledge in reason and words. Don't I know the stars don't move? he asked himself, gazing at the bright planet which had shifted its position up to the topmost twig of the birch tree. But looking at the movements of the stars, I can't picture to myself the rotation of the earth, and I'm right in saying that the stars move. And could the astronomers have understood and calculated anything if they had taken into account all the complicated and varied motions of the earth? All the marvelous conclusions they have reached about the distances, weights, movements, and deflections of the heavenly bodies are only founded on the apparent motions of the heavenly bodies around a stationary earth, on that very motion I see before me now, which has been so for millions of men during long ages, and was and will be always alike and can always be trusted. And just as the conclusions of the astronomers would have been vain and uncertain if not founded on observations of the seen heavens, in relation to a single meridian and a single horizon, so would my conclusions be vain and uncertain if not founded on that conception of right, which has been, and will be, always alike for all men, which has been revealed to me as a Christian, and which can always be trusted in my soul." The question of other religions and their relations to divinity I have no right to decide, and no possibility of deciding. "'Oh, you haven't gone in, then?' he heard Kitty's voice all at once, as she came by the same way to the drawing-room. "'What is it? You're not worried about anything?' she said, looking intently at his face in the starlight. But she could not have seen his face if a flash of lightning had not hidden the stars and revealed it. In that flash she saw his face distinctly, and seeing him calm and happy, she smiled at him. She understands, he thought. She knows what I'm thinking about. Shall I tell her, or not? Yes, I'll tell her. But at the moment he was about to speak, she began speaking. Kostya, do something for me, she said. Go into the corner room and see if they've made it all right for Sergey Ivanovitch. I can't very well. See if they've put the new washstand in it. Very well, I'll go directly, said Levin, 
standing up and kissing her. No, I'd better not speak of it, he thought, when she had gone in before him. It's a secret for me alone, of vital importance for me, and not to be put into words. This new feeling has not changed me, has not made me happy and enlightened all of a sudden, as I had dreamed, just like the feeling for my child. There was no surprise in this either. Faith, or not faith, I don't know what it is, but this feeling has come just as imperceptibly through suffering, and has taken firm root in my soul. I shall go on in the same way, losing my temper with Ivan the coachman, falling into angry discussions, expressing my opinions tactlessly. There will still be the same wall between the holy of holies of my soul and other people, even my wife. I shall still go on scolding her for my own terror, and being remorseful for it. I shall still be as unable to understand with my reason why I pray, and I shall still go on praying. But my life now, my whole life apart from anything that can happen to me, every minute of it is no more meaningless as it was before, but it has the positive meaning of goodness, which I have the power to put into it. End of chapter 19, end of book 8, and end of Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy.